So um, I'm going to talk about statistical analysis, and as you'll see, that it is really not independent, this section of study design, and we're, really, we're going to revisit many of the things that came up before. I'm um, trying to put a little bit more of a spin on actual statisti statistical testing. And I would like to draw a commonality uh, between complex and Mendelian traits and show that many of the problems that we have for Mendelian traits also are true for complex traits in that although we can implicate perhaps a gene, um, that it's more difficult sometimes to say about causality of individual variants, in particular those variants that are very rare. I think one advantage that we have right now is that we can look at data on a genome level and we're not um, just have to focus on, a, on individual genes. And this is also very true for a Mendelian traits where often people would choose their favorite, uh, they would start choosing their favorite candidate genes within a linkage region and once they thought they found something, they would stop. So now we're at a huge advantage that we can look at in, in, at the entire region or the, uh, uh, you know, and we don't have to just focus on a particular set of genes, our favorite genes. So um, for co I would first like to start with complex traits. Um, so you know, the rare variants for complex traits, they're going to have effect sizes which are l large to odds ratios approaching one. I don't think we can be so optimistic as um, many people were in the very beginning that you know, these rare variants are going to have huge effects. We, need very sm we only need a small s sample size to detect them. I think that's already extremely clear that these effect sizes are not so large and we do need large sample sizes. So because we need such large sample sizes, it's really very important that we have international consortia that will be able to share data. Uh, not only on the traits, uh, either qualitative or quantitative traits, but also uh, control data. And so that's really the, um, going to be the only way that we're going to be able to approach the sample sizes that are large enough in order to detect association. And also, um, additionally, it'll be uh, very important to have uh, publicly available cohorts um, available for investigators. So. Um, one thing we have to keep in mind that for um, very rare variants, we will not be able to test um, individual rare variants even if we have uh, very large, large sam sample sizes. And so what we have to do in order to detect association is that we have to analyze um, the rare variants in aggregate. And usually what we're doing as of late is um, we're aggregating the variants across a region, which is usually a, a gene. Now, this is going to be more, you know, problematic when we want to look outside of uh, gene regions, um, because it's very difficult to know which rare which rare variants we should um, aggregate. Um, I, I don't think that's clear at all. At least I don't have an answer of what we should do when we want to start looking outside of uh, gene regions. Um, this is also a little bit of a, pro a problematic approach because. Um, People tend to select different types of, of uh, variants to test, and then they um, will keep on changing the set of variants that they're testing or the tests they will perform, and they tend to forget everything they um, uh, did before. So even though they have a very, even if they have a very small p-value, um, that p-value is not adjusted for multiple testing. So that's also a problem um, that we uh, run a, run across. So um, even if we do perform, you know, do the right thing when we're performing these tests, adjust for multiple testing, um, you know, require, you know, a very um, small p-value and we replicate the region, we still have the problem that because we analyze these rare variants in aggregate and we may be, we are able to say something that the gene is involved for the very rare variants, it's, it's, you really can't say if they're causal or not because within this, aggregate test, of course, you're going to have causal and non-causal variants. Um, also, we have to be very careful when we're performing our tests. Um, um, one particular problem that's probably much more important uh, for rare variants because we see a very, um, very large difference even with um, very closely related populations. And even when before we started in, uh, looking at um, the next generation sequencing and analyzing rare variants, we already had a very 
a strong clue that rare variants would be uh, very different in um, different populations, e even that were very similar. If we look at the Ashkenazi Jewish population, um, the spectrum of allelic uh, um, rare variants is quite different from other, rare, um, other European populations. So even if we have um, very um, uh, uh, neighboring populations and we're anal uh, analyzing them, this is still a problem. For today, we're basically using the exact same methods to control for population substructure um, that was used for um, uh, common variants, um, and it's really not clear if th that's adequate uh, for rare variants. I would say we don't know. And um, so, um, so th some of the ways that we can avo avoid fa false positive, which I mentioned a moment ago, but I'll revisit, is um, we need to avoid, if we do perform multiple testing, we do need to control uh, for it, and we need to um, have a statistical uh, tests that are um, significant, That's, um, but, but those significant levels still have to be determined. I don't think we really know what kind of uh, level of significance we need yet, and so that's something that really uh, needs to be investigated. And it's also necessary that the findings are replicated in a, an appended sample. Um, here we do have some questions, is how are we going to replicate those findings in an independent sample? One thing you have to be aware of is um, you, you have to, you would probably have to make sure that you sample um, your new sample in, within the same population. So, because if you go to a neighboring population, um, the spectrum of rare variants can be uh, quite different. And so, what if you um, look at a neighboring population and you resequence that gene region and um, you're looking at a new set of variants? Uh, so if you, did you really replicate it? Um, what is the level of significance can you uh, find? If you didn't replicate, it, replicate, is it because the spectrum of um, rare variance is different or they're really, um, that was a f uh, false positive finding in your first study? So these are all new uh, types of caveats that we have uh, with complex traits um, for rare variants that we weren't uh, such a problem with the common variants. Um, so, um, so although I think that we can uh, have statistical evidence uh, for uh, regions or genes or higher frequency rare uh, variants, um, we still have this problem that we uh, cannot have statistical evidence uh, to determine the causality of very rare variants by testing individual uh, variants because you just won't have the power to detect association. So how about um, Mendelian traits? So um, I think that we really need uh, more evidence than a single variant um, in an affected in individual and that variant is not observed in databases. Um, also, if we have a small family segregating a rare variant, it is also not sufficient evidence that the variant is causal. You're going to have many variants just by chance um, segregating in these small families. So that's not a very surprising fam uh, finding at all. So one thing I think is really very helpful is if we go back, you know, a decade or two and uh, we use linkage analysis um, to implicate uh, a region. And we can implicate a region either using large families or uh, multiple small families. And we don't really have to reinvent the wheel here. Um, how to go about doing this is, well, uh, is, is in the literature, and so we can just go back to these um, old methods to establish linkage to a region. Um, so um, I think what's very useful um, in implicating a, a gene is having multiple families with variants within the, within the same uh, gene, and these variants can either be the same variant or um, uh, different variants, and it's also, um, um, helpful if you see that these variants are absent or um, only in very low frequencies in controls. Of course, if, the, if uh, you have reduced penetrance, you would expect to see these variants also in controls. And you can use statistical uh, tests to perfor uh, and perform them to show that there is actual differences um, in the frequency of these variants between cases and control. So this can provide evidence that a gene is involved in disease etiology. Um, however, we still are back to the same problem. What happens if we, ha we only see that um, variant in a single family? 
Um, that's still not proof that that variant is involved in the disease etiology. And if you know the region of linkage, it's not surprising at all that that variant segregates with the disease um, within the family. It's going to be on the same haplotype uh, with the disease variant. So, you know, of course it's going to segregate, I would say. And uh, so that's not really evidence that the variant is involved in disease etiology. Um, so we can also look at, um, uh, in many cases, we do have these um, single individuals. Maybe we know they have a family history of disease, uh, but we don't have any other family members available for study. So we can also um, uh, study um, these Mendelian traits uh, and perform association analysis uh, using these individual cases. And we can uh, go about looking for association by using these rare variant aggregate association tests um, that were developed for complex traits. However, um, this can be very problematic for diseases with um, locus heterogeneity. So if you have high levels of locus heterogeneity, so there'll be many of these individuals that they don't have uh, variants in the same gene or very reduced penetrance. And here you would need a very large sample size. Um, but however, if you're looking at a rare Mendelian, um, it's very difficult to uh, get uh, these very large sample size. So that is a very big caveat um, for this particular approach. It's going to work in some cases, but not always. Um, so what are, what is some additional evidence we could use? So um, I would say uh, seeing variants at higher frequencies in controls than cases can help rule out um, that a variant is causal. However, we can't use the opposite logic and say that if a variant is not seen in controls, it is evidence of causality. And we have to remember that due to recent population group, groups that there are many extremely rare, case, uh, rare variants, which uh, in some cases are private. So even if you had an extremely large database, even of ethnically matched uh, controls, and you don't find that variant in your database, um, that is not evidence of causality. So how about de novo variants? So, you know, de novo uh, variants, especially those that are non synonymous are very rare. So, but just by chance, if we look at enough, uh, enough trios, uh, we're going to have um, uh, variants that fall within genes that it's easy to build a story about that particular gene being involved in disease etiology. So I don't think that um, when you have um, a, d a de novo event, that evidence on its own is enough to say that a variant is causal. So how about experimental support? So I think that ex experimental support is um, complementary um, to statistical support for uh, phenotype. And we definitely can say something about the causality, uh, the functionality, sorry, of that particular variant. But we have to remember, just because a variant is functional, it does not prove causality. And it's really unfortunate because for many years we've used the word functional and causal as, as though they mean exactly the same thing, which they clearly don't. You know. Um, a causal variant has to be functional, but a functional variant does not have to be causal. So how about some t uh, statistical tests for very rare variants? So one thing we could look at is um, that if we have a class of, of variants that are only seen in cases but not in controls, that could pr provide additional evidence of causality and uh, also could be held to high statistical standards. However, in many cases, this is not going to work. Um, one thing that we have to be very careful um, that when we perform our statistical tests is often we peek at our data and we say, well, if we just test for this, a difference of this and the other thing, uh, then we'll find something. So if you didn't take a peek of your data, that might not be the obvious um, test to perform. So you are actually performing multiple testing uh, without actually uh, doing the test. So we have to be very careful about that. So here I'd like to, um, you know, of course, there's many other uh, discussion questions, but um, here's a few to get us going. Great. Thank you very much, Suzanne. So yes, please. Um, one thing I'm very, very curious about is increasingly with, um, you know, whole genome sequencing, we're going to be seeing that a lot of the variants are 
more complex events like CNVs and so forth. And I'm really interested in how people are going to think about the statistics of these. I mean, how they're going to aggregate them together, how similar they have to actually be to be considered one thing and, and so forth. I'm just curious. Any thoughts on that? So that, that may not be a statistical question, um, perhaps more of a structural question. Those, those of us who do structure want to comment on that? Nobody does. Oh, come on. So I, mean, I think it's very problematic. And also, right now, we still have the problem of just accurately, accurately calling in um, indels and, lar uh, and larger copy number variants. So I, th I think that is going to also be a problem of how we collapse them. Yes, please. I'll just, uh, I, I think it's a problem that's going to occupy us for the next four or five years for sure. But I think the fir best first pass approach is just to translate all forms of variation into some sort of common space, which is what is the funct predicted functional impact of that variant on a gene. So Daniel's already, his work and other work, uh, other work by the loss of function group in the Thousand Genomes Project has already, you know, started with the, you know, maybe the easiest case scenario, which is, you know, mapping all types of variation. Uh, all, all classes of variation into that loss of function space. Now, uh, less, less harmful, less uh, uh, pathogenic types of variants will be harder to interpret with, in terms of indels and CNVs, but that would be my first pass suggestion. David? So, so I think there are a lot of technical challenges. There are technical challenges, um, you know, for example, identifying whether the, a, a set of CNVs includes some subset that are, in fact, the same or not the same. So how do you group them? Um, there are technical challenges, even in what Don, you're suggesting, um, for sure, in trying to assign, um, you know, whether variants are in the same class or not. That's usually, you know, very difficult to do. There's all sorts of technical challenges, but maybe our biggest problem is actually just intellectual integrity, I would say, because even within a class of variants, um, you know, there, there isn't a consistent effort right now to correct for all the tests that would be represented within that class of variants. And if we only did that, like, you know, de novo mutations, um, you know, they're always there. Um, and so the, the, the kind of presumption that when you get a de novo mutation, it's causal is, is patently absurd. And so here we are in 2012 where this is happening. Um, but it's actually a trivial exercise to say, look, okay, we're going to have to account for what the null distribution is of de novo mutations and ask whether we have an excess beyond that. Um, and, you know, Mark has, has uh, very rightly emphasized that there's, you know, um, often uh, some little signal in data, but not maybe even a significant excess beyond null expectation, even when you know or strongly suspect some of the de novo mutations are causal. So I guess what I would say is that maybe the first step is simply to require clarity about what the hypothesis is, you know, that I'm going to test all variants of class X treated as a group with some kind of a prior hypothesis, and that clearly is justified. So the idea that we do away with that doesn't make any sense, because clearly loss of function mutations are different from ones that are not assigned to function and so on. But within identified classes of variants, we have to insist on absolutely strict rigor in doing the statistics. I would say that's probably the most important first step we could take. We have, uh, Jeff, did you have a comment, or, or and then Shamil? Just a brief one about, uh, specifically about structural variation and the change in technology. So uh, at Sanger, we're involved in a, um, a project called Deciphering Developmental Disorders, where it's a collaboration with the regional genetic services. They submit undiagnosed cases. We do both uh, a very high resolution array CGH and exome sequencing on the trios. And we just have a huge problem with essentially taking, because the, the array CGH we designed has dense coverage in all the exons, so we can tend to find quite small insertions and deletions of, you know, one or two exons or between, you know, even in an intron, say. And the problem we have is, you know, if you think about kind of more traditional, very large um, copy number events in developmental disorders, the, the functional question you're asking is, you know, okay, it deletes like eight genes, and so obviously that is having a function on those genes. And what we're, de what we're dealing with now is obviously much more difficult to assign any causality, and especially because we don't have breakpoints in any sense with the ACGH data. Um, and we also have this thing of we're building up a pretty decent um, and detailed map of copy number variants in controls, both with published data like stuff that Don and Thousand Genomes have done, um, and also we've, we've run our specific technologies on control populations in the UK. But you get this thing of, you know, the 
the boundaries of the variance are very fuzzy and they have varying overlap. And how do you decide? This thing has been seen in 10% of the population, but it overlaps by like 46%. And it's kind of a completely, at the moment, unanswerable question about how do you interpret that? Because the, you know, so we, we make up some rules of thumb basically, but I think it's, it's a massively non-obvious problem. And it might be not even possible until we sort of do these things entirely with sequencing and can routinely get breakpoint definition. Uh, Shamil? Uh, so I have a very technical statistical um, comment uh, to what David called, let's test together variance in functional class X. And, and this, is, this is how most groups do the analysis. At the same time, if you read methods literature, there are many methods suggesting to group all variants together and use functional weights. Some sort of probabilities that we believe that this uh, class of variants is more functional than another one, weight every variant and, and have aggregate tests without testing this functional category, then do separate tests on another functional category, and then do third functional test on yet another functional category. Um, surprisingly, in, in real studies, as soon as you're on conference call and decide discuss real study, um, all this literature is available, but people are not using this weighted test. So people think in terms of this functional category, this functional category, and this functional category, let's do aggregate analysis separately. And I'm not sure this is, this is the optimal way to go forward. Before I call on Daniel, does somebody want to respond specifically to Shamil's point? I think it's a great point, but I, I actually do think it does depend the context. Like in some um, diseases, there's a uh, there's, there's clarity that there's a uh, uh, an important contribution of de novo mutations um, just from just from the the, the, the pattern of, of disease presentation, and, and in that case, I think it's entirely appropriate to have a focused study on de novo mutations. And so there are cir circumstances under which you pluck out a class of, of mutations and you say, okay, I'm going to I'm going to analyze that class of mutations and ask for evidence within it. So I think that there are contexts in which that that is appropriate. Although obviously in other settings looking for epilepsy risk factors in general, the schizophrenia risk factors in general, which you describe is perfectly true. People say, okay, look, I, I look for CNVs of this sort, and here's my p-value for those CNVs, and then, and then you look for CNVs of a different sort, and, and then you move on from CNVs to, you know, certainly that is happening. Um. We had Daniel, then Bet, then Mark. No, no, it's not. I just wanted to say that, I mean, I, want, I think one issue with this sort of functional weight is it tends to um, very much overemphasize uh, genes and things we know. I mean, you know, any time we start to think about, you know, regions of the genome, pr principally outside of genes that we don't know as much about, um, you know, they always just get downweighted. And I think, you know, in a sense, maybe unfairly or incorrectly or something. Okay. I think we have Daniel then, Beth. Uh, I wanted to just um, say a few words about um, uh, how we use uh, the, the New England Journal of Medicine um, protocols, uh, which we, and our requirements um, of authors of reports of clinical trials. Um, and this kind of partly goes to your point, David, about pre-specifying um, study design. So we um, require in order to consider a clinical trial, in order for a paper um, describing that to actually arrive on an editor's desk, that it um, has, has been previously registered prior to the enrollment of the first patient um, in that trial. And, and if it's not, then the paper is not considered. It is, doesn't go out for review. And when we publish these trials, very often we'll publish the protocols alongside them. And before a paper goes to press, in fact, before we really seriously consider accepting it, we ensure that there's um, accurate correlation between the trial and the report. I, I do think some kind of um, documented pre-specification could be helpful. Um, the extent to which the community wants to model this on, the, on, on that kind of um, system would require consideration. Um, there are also other ways I think journals can consider um, helping to ensure that um, study design is clearly described. Um, and these would include um, codified descriptions of clinical phenotype, um, criteria for labeling variants as causative um, or of unknown significance, um, implementing um, easy mechanisms for corrections 
of previous claims of causality that have subsequently been determined not to be correct. Um, and, and I think the, the easiest way for editors to do this is, is to have um, dedicated sections and methods and appendices for these types of information. No, that's, that's an excellent point. In fact, if you wanted to show those so that we could get them all down, um, you can, I think you can ask him to link to your machine. Um, if you had them on your machine, you may not. You may have them just in your brain. <laughs> so. we'll, we'll get them from you later. Daniel. So uh, I think um, both Suzanne and David, G, uh, David Goldstein sorry, mentioned the, these opportunities for massively parallel post hoc uh, analysis. And I think it obviously is a critical issue in this, in this complex space at the moment. In, in the GWAS era, as Mark mentioned yesterday, there were clear standards established for what, what is genome-wide significance, how, how can that be defined? And in fact, one of the reasons that GWAS have been so successful is because everyone does a very you know, tightly standardised approach. Um, how, how close are we to being able to define that, though, in the rare, in the rare variant setting? Like, is, is there any move towards consensus? Is there, is there a process for building consensus? Can we reach a GWAS-like stringency of approaches? I, I think we will, but I think, you know, still we don't, don't really know what we're doing as far as analyzing these rare variants if we want to be truthful about it, and we're trying different things. But I think we will, I think we will reach a consensus, not only for analysis, about, but also for data quality control is another issue which I didn't bring, bring up, which is also extremely important uh, before even beginning to analyze the data. We do have Greg, but I might, I might just point out that a lot of that, you know, clear consensus that we had in, in the GWAS era came out of a meeting very much like this. So, so we're hoping before you all leave at five today that we'll have that consensus. Um, we, we may not, um, but, but certainly in the, in the manuscript drafts that go around, we, we need to come to it because I, I think, you know, this is our chance. So. On that point, I would just be a little bit pessimistic in the sense that we really don't know, you know, so part of that depends upon the whole idea of exome sequencing, right, is sort of an implicit assumption that things that disrupt proteins are a priori enriched for disease causality. And we just, we don't know the extent to that, to which that's true, but getting that quantification right would be important for sort of calibrating the false discovery rates of p-values that you get on the back end, right? So there's, and, and we're a long way from knowing what a promoter annotation is worth or what a non-synonymous annotation is worth or a hypersensitive site or any of these things in terms of the back end, how much it enriches for causality versus not causality. So it's. It's unrealistic, I think, to expect to get a p-value threshold, for example, that we can apply. So David has, has a comment, but I might just stimulate our, our colleagues here from ENCODE who are obviously interested in things other than protein coding genes. I realize it's still 6.30 in the morning on the West Coast, but, um, but if you could have another cup of coffee and join in, in the conversation. I was just going to say, I, I also am pretty pessimistic about our being able to use the, the sort of basic model in, in, in GWAS to figure out sort of the right way to analyze sequence data. Um, I think what we can do is use that experience to identify things that are clearly wrong. And so I think we can, we can really find bad practice. But I don't think that we can define good practice with that example. And the basic reason for that is that I really, I myself, and there, this, there may be variation of view on this, I think, here, but I myself have an orientation that we can't escape the biology and when we're interpreting sequence data. And, and for that reason, we really, it'll be very difficult for us to establish a standardized statistical framework. Whereas in GWAS, the, the biology was entirely escapable because the appropriate way to deal with the variants that were being interrogated was to treat them all the same. And, and that, that fundamental distinction means that we're not going to be able to establish be best practice in the same way. So we have, we have Shamil and Nancy, but let, let me just respond to, to that point. I wasn't suggesting that we take GWAS as the model. What I was saying was five years ago we were having the same conversation, oh my God, what are we going to do? Nobody knows how to do this, et cetera, et cetera, and we came out with something. So, okay, uh, Shamil? Uh, so uh, I, I think there are two different problems here, so we're, we're, we're saying it's difficult. So one problem is implicating genes through collective analysis of rare variants uh, in this gene complex trait, and, and the second problem is finding individual variants. And implicating genes, I, I don't see why uh, following GWAS sort of paradigm is impossible. We have either burden tests or over dispersion tests. We run them. I think there is reasonable agreement what constitutes exome-wide p-value. Uh, and even if uh, we see some deflation, you can do permutation of the whole exome. So statistically, the, the, the picture is, is reasonably clear. Uh, as soon as we're talking about function of individual variants, uh, then uh, 
I, I think I agree with Suzanne, there is no way in, in purely statistical realm to tell which of these variants exactly is functional and which variant is not functional. Uh, so so that's, pro that's, that's a much harder problem. But for implicating genes, I think we, we can simply follow uh, GWAS paradigm. So um, at, on, on Greg's point, um, on uh, where we're only looking at protein coding genes and, and, and all of the story, and I think many of us in the room, uh, certainly I do believe that majority of functionally significant nucleotides lie outside of protein coding genes. It's just uh, I have no idea how to build burden or, or dispersion tests to do, do similar approach in non-coding DNA, and, and, and I, I just think we're lacking ideas how to proceed here. Nancy and then Mark. I want to come back to a point that Suzanne made very well, but I think we, we need to keep in mind. We're, we're used in statistics to, to recognizing missing data problems and, and trying to, to, to quantify what that means. Let's for a moment think that we actually know and understand everything in the genome that has functional consequence, that, that it's not a mystery anymore what variants can have an effect on uh, genes regulation, on a gene's function, um, and that, that we even know about all of the other functional units. It's still a big problem. We have to recognize that for any given phenotype, we don't know yet what functional variants can actually be contributory. And it will be different for different phenotypes. We will often get positive results from burden tests for two different diseases where the contributory set of functional variants may be non-overlapping. Um, and so it's a hard problem even if, if all of the things we don't actually know today, if we actually knew all of those things. And, and so I think we also have to be careful about our language with respect to the words like functional versus something like contributory. Um, a lot of the variants that will be tested or that we'll use weighting factors for, I mean, we, we really are weighting using information that we know about. These variants do have function with respect to the gene, but they still may not be contributory to any phenotypes that we're studying. And, and so, so language and precision also matters, in, particularly in publication context. But, but I think even in inaccurate communications with each other. So um, I want to agree very strongly with uh, Shamil. I think um, that we, you know, what's not possible for us to do is to come away with a number like we did in, in GWAS space. And we all recognize this is a much more complex problem. and. There are, as David suggests, a number of different types of studies that can be embedded in a genome or exome sequencing study. We don't yet know how to read and weight the non-coding component of the genome as we move from whole exome to whole genome. But at the same time, I think, you know, there is no reason why we can't outline what are the statistical principles into which we will analyze this data and, to, you know, deliver the concepts to ourselves, our community, to journals as to how one should approach the problem of evaluating things. As these, as David says, most of the time this is just eliminating stuff that's patently wrong, but I think at the same time the genome is finite. I'm very comfortable with our, you know, with, you know, having access to very large exome sequencing data sets that we now begin to understand the content, the distribution in terms of frequency and, and each different functional category of how much variation there is in an exome and, and any number of exomes and can develop statistical inferences for particular questions that we might want to ask from that. There's not just one question, there's not just one analytic approach, and I think that's right, and as Jeff pointed out, depending on what the underlying architecture is in a particular gene and a particular disease, the best approach is going to be different. So it is much harder, but I think there are common principles that, and, and that, you know, as Shamil has outlined it, that we can all aim for, and as we learn how to interpret the rest of the genome, we can modify those and, and, and so forth. Jeff. I just wanted to um, 
make an observation about the, if you sort of read the, the recent, you know, last, I don't know, a couple of years or so, literature in journals like GenEpi and Bioinformatics, and um, there's, there's a huge flourishing of different statistical approaches to, to um, combining and collapsing and so forth, rare variants and sequence data. And it kind of reminds me of in the, in the sort of pre-GWAS years, there was a huge flourishing of haplotype-based association tests and, you know, very complex and esoteric uh, epistasis tests. And as it happened, the problem at that point wasn't that we needed a different statistical test. It was that the data set wasn't really there yet. And in fact, almost all of the GWAS findings were based on statistics that were invented eight years ago. And I don't necessarily think that's going to be the case now, but I do sort of have this sense that um, I, think it's, I think that kind of that process of going through exploring the different statistical ideas is a useful one, but that my guess would be that um, eventually we'll get to the point where there's a kind of agreed way to do, I mean, there are, as Mark said, there are various different analytical questions, but that we'll eventually settle on a reasonably straightforward statistical way to ask each of those questions, and it's going to be a matter of accumulating the right types of data to be able to start, because right now there haven't been many published actual associations from any of these 200 methods. Uh, yes, Jay. Uh, so I was just going to, um, I guess, so it seems like when, if one were to publish a, a rare variant and complex disease study, I, I think one would presumably, or a reviewer would require one, goes through the exercise of trying to calculate a p-value for those things. But for Mendelian disorders, I, I think pe people often, or maybe even typically, or nearly always don't calculate a p-value, let's say, right? You say, I have six to eight of my probands of de novo mutations, right? That, that's a clear result, but no one goes through the exercise. Um, I don't know how people, I mean, maybe the guidance should be that people always calculate a p-value. So even like, there's a sort of vague standard of a you know, second family, right? Second family yeah. and you're done, but, but what does that actually mean, right? I mean, second family in a gene that has a high mutation rate, you know? Um, so, yeah. But. Right, so one, uh, again, drawing the analogy to where we were with GWAS. So there was actually a pretty big debate also uh, between people who sort of wanted to set a universal threshold, and then there was kind of a Bayesian type of argument. And the universal threshold essentially became the standard because it turned out that probably was more or less right to treat a lot of the variants the same, that, the, that we couldn't identify a class of variants which were more likely to be associated. It's not totally clear we're in the exact same situation, so we may actually end up, you know, more of a Bayesian, until we at least have more experience under our belt, we may end up trying to be at least in a more of a Bayesian world. The problem is, of course, without the experience, it's very difficult to write down exactly what those priors are, but I think that is, it was for a while, I think, a useful framework to think about it. In some sense, the calculating p-values from multiple families, that you can also think of that in kind of a Bayesian context. You have some prior probability that the, and even for known variants, I think in, in a lot of the things that we'll come up with, that may be a useful context to say, here's a prior probability, and then what's the, you know, what was the probability of observing that data under the model of this gene is causal or it's, you know, random chance, and then, you know, what's the posterior probability that this is actually valid, either the gene is associated or the variant is actually contributory. I think it's, it's a critical point that's come up a couple of times now is this idea of, you know, some sort of weighting approach. But I haven't yet heard, it, like, how do we actually go about empirically calculating those priors for the, for the different classes of variants? What is, what is exactly the right approach to get, to get those weights? How, how should we approach this? I think that's extremely difficult. First, because, um, you know, if you look at just, first of all, you would just have to work on functionality, and the probabilities would have to be working on functionality. So, um, and so there you're kind of equating functionality means causality. But we're even in a worse position than that, because a lot of these priors for functionality are not all that good. Um, we could also think of um, a variable selection approach, um, which would help could help us um, implicate, a, you know, a specific gene. Again, we would still have the problem of saying something about individual variants, even if we were just selecting out a subset of the variants. Um, of course, then we would pay the price for mu multiple testing because, 
if you're using variable selection, you have to consider that you didn't perform one test. But that might be another approach. And, you know, Shamil, Shamil might want to comment on that some more because he's done some work on that. Uh, so I'm, I'm uh, happy to come in here. So, uh, of course, what I think we do not know uh, about functionality of rare variants and complex traits uh, is whether those are same types of variants we see in Mendelian traits. Because I think part of the literature suggests that, oh, these are heterozygote carriers or something like this. And some literature is assuming that these are functional hypomorphs. So what you see if there is a gene involved in Mendelian trait and you see variants in, so for example, in uh, hypercholesterolemia, and then you see impact on a general variation in cholesterol, people would say these are hypomorphs. These are not the same exact mutations that uh, cause Mendelian phenotypes. However, uh, we can take AGMD, and, and we all heard how suboptimal AG, uh, AGMD is, uh, where we know mutations involved in um, in, Mendelian, uh, in Mendelian traits, and Heidi may come up with, uh, with ClinVar, uh, with a better database. And what we saw in Heidi's slide yesterday, there is a gene where we know how many nonsense variants versus how many missense variant in this particular gene uh, were confidently implicated in Mendelian phenotype. And this, in, in some Bayesian sense, this, this would give you prior, for example, what's relative weight of nonsense variant versus missense variant in this gene. So, so there are, I agree with Suzanne that the problem is very hard, but there are some potential ways to, uh, to train system and, and learn uh, priors for various functional categories. Great, thanks. We have, we have Greg and Ewan. Yeah, I was just gonna say and follow up to Shamil, a lot of this is, is gonna have to be driven empirically, right? We just sort of collect knowledge about variants that we believe are causal, variants that we believe are not causal and everything in between and try and learn what their properties are. And so it, later on, we'll talk about this in a few of, uh, of our the annotation working group slides. Uh, and the reality is that we're going to have to live in that sort of empirical world where it's going to be based on permutations and simulations, because uh, we're not going to have sort of true biologically defined and quantified weights for, for a while yet. But we can do things empirically to, to get useful measures, if nothing else. So a related point from the other direction that touches on a, a little bit of a few of the ideas to do with Bayesian analysis. Um, is the unit of collapse, we haven't really talked about this here, we just sort of assumed the gene is a unit of collapse and we talked about the thousands of collapsing tests there are. I think it's a very difficult problem, but maybe a comment on, you know, at what, at what level do we collapse? Do we collapse at exon? Do we collapse at transcript? Do we collapse at gene? Do we collapse at pathway? And when we talk about pathways, we're talking about years of, of biology that have potentially uh, fairly securely tied one gene's effect, functional effect, to another. So do we leverage that or, or do we take more of a GWAS approach and step back and, and be agnostic? Yeah, I, I just I do want to add to that comment. I, I do think people sometimes also don't appreciate the transcript complexity of the average gene. I mean, the average gene really is many, many different transcripts, and some of them are only very rarely seen, and some are very commonly seen. And, you know, it, you really do, I think, people really have to think how to weight all the transcripts properly and how to exclude some and so forth to really think about how to aggregate things properly for, for a gene. I, I think that <clears throat> the... The question, I don't think it's going to be possible to come up with a sensible approach to weighting. And it, you know, it kind of obviously will vary from phenotype to phenotype. But I think it'll even vary within a phenotype from gene to gene, in that gene A may be that you need some loss of function mutation to confer risk. And so the, the most powerful weight there will be essentially to put all the weight on loss of function mutations. And gene B, it might be that essentially it's something to do with differential, different transcripts. And so it's, you know, a set of splicing or uh, expression regulating SNPs and that the weight should go there. And so I, I, think it's, I don't think it's a realistic goal to say, oh, we can come up with the right way to, re to weight different um, coding and, and functional variation. I think it's, it's going to have to be a kind of collection of things that are appropriate in different situations. So we'll let Mark respond to that yeah. and then Greg. Well, I just do want to respond. I do think there is a natural way, though, to think about just the entire genome uniformly, and that is in the framework of selection. I mean, the different bits of the genome are, are conserved to different degrees and are under different degrees of selection, and that's a fairly uniform thing. And you, you can use that, I mean, throughout the entire genome as kind of a universal standard to some degree so, about how important something is. So we have Greg and then Gonzalo. Right, so just uh, a comment here that um, in terms of, of trying to predict from a phenotype what underlying functionality should be enriched or not enriched, I really think that's, that's unrealistic. You know, should diabetes be more relevant, more sensitive to splicing versus missense versus not? You know, that's really difficult. Uh, 
but there are sort of different modes of annotation. So the comment was brought up about if you suspect a de novo origin for a phenotype. So that's a genetic argument that you can build from family history. And there's a, you can build a, a better prior that sort of better weights that. But from the point of view of function, CNVs versus missense, it's really hard to do that from a level of a disease point of view. There's no way to predict that. Yeah, so, um, you know, so, so this idea of predicting weights, I, I actually am very close to Jeff's point that it's, it's very hard. You know, a bit of data that's, uh, that's out there is, uh, you know, some of my colleagues in the exome sequencing project, I think looking at uh, uh, LDL cholesterol levels, actually, you know, there's, there's a number of uh, genes where rare variants have been implicated, and so they actually apply the series <laughs> of burden tests and say, you know, which of those signals can we pick up? And the... Uh, you know, and the optimal test was very different for each one of those known loci. It turns out that, for example, in LDLR, for, for the LDL phenotype, almost all the variants that are important are singletons. They're often, you know, premature stops and very obvious functional consequence. Uh, if you go look, for example, at PCSK9, there's a, a variety of relatively frequent variants there that are important, you know, and so the, the optimal <coughs> way to identify one or the other is different, even though it's the same phenotype, and these are very well established uh, genes. You know, uh, if uh, you know, if I, if I was going to try and speak as a statistician, you ask me, you know, what's the way in this context to be, you know, to be strict and avoid making you know false discoveries? Is you set the threshold, assuming that people have tried you know all possible weights, and. Uh, and, and, you know, it's going to be a more stringent threshold than if you use any one set of weights. Uh, but, but it's very hard, in, at least where we are now, to, to, to believe that, you know, anyone started with a single set of weights and did just that and, and took their study through to completion. And also that if that single set that they started off with didn't have a result, they wouldn't have modified. You know, so I think what you want is to figure out, if you used all possible weights, figure out what would be the threshold. You know, th there will be a threshold. It will be more stringent than if you use no weightings. I mean, are there effectively infinite ways to perform this analysis, though? I mean, it's, uh, but, you know, it's, it's the same <coughs> as with the variable threshold test. You know, mm -hmm. in fact, those tests are actually very helpful in thinking mm -hmm. about should I decide rare variants are mm -hmm. below 5 percent or below 1 percent or just the singletons. You know, you, you do try all the possible cut points and, you know, it actually it's just a slightly more stringent threshold, but much easier to interpret than looking at all the tests individually. Yeah. No, I, I think I've um, struggled with the idea of how to, you know, employ weightings because, well, in spirit, I would, I would like to, you know, embrace Shamil's model wholeheartedly. Um, you know, when, you know, looking through the sequencing we're doing, mostly focused on, you know, childhood neurodevelopmental, you know, neuropsychiatric outcomes, you know, we know the most, you know, severe genetic cases that we look for involve, you know, a host of genes for which the mechanism of action is clearly de novo heterozygous gain of function missense mutations, and we have another whole host where the mechanism of action is primarily loss of function, either in a recessive or a haploinsufficient um, fashion. And, you know, a, a single statistic that weights all the, you know, it, it can't be optimal in that setting when we're looking for so many different genes that are going to have different modes of action. But maybe, you know, it, it could be that a higher level um, set of analyses that um, has, you know, different categories in it that we might assign weights to collectively might be able to, to achieve this. But, you know, it, it doesn't bother me very much at this point to have a, a small set of sensible categories that we explore, and we might learn how to do this better, and I think we'll obviously have to as we move to the non-coding variation where there's not likely to be such clear-cut and discrete categories as, as gain of function and loss of function, um, but it's something we, we wrestle with right now. Uh, so, so small comment uh, to, to Gonzalo's point is, is that when you're uh, using several tests, and this is similar, I agree, to variable threshold tests, but what's helping you is that these tests are highly dependent. So multiple test penalty you pay is much less than in true uh, number of independent tests because uh, different weighting, different allele frequency cutoffs uh, would, would produce highly, uh, highly dependent results. So these are not truly independent tests, and uh, when we're talking about this multiple testing, is not as scary as, as uh, may have sound. 
Yeah, I, just on this, this, if, this part of the conversation is, I think, incredibly important. And I, for, I'm, just to state my bias, I'm a huge fan of weights. And I'm a huge believer that Bayesian reasoning is going to be mandatory here. And in, in response to your question, which I think was very pertinent about, is there an infinity of models? In principle, there is, because you can change every weight along a continuous row. But if you write down your model, and if you get a hit, you can do a sensitivity analysis to say, under what range of changes to my priors do I still get the same result? And then a reviewer or a skeptic could look at that and say, OK, is that range of priors that are all in an equivalence class reasonable? And if it is, then maybe you've made some progress in terms of getting the hits. I'd just like to say, if you're not Bayesian, which maybe you don't have to be, but, but then looking at one of these studies without priors or without weights is the equivalent of saying all previous biology is irrelevant and I want biology to bang me over the head with this signal, otherwise I'm not going to believe it. And sometimes biology will do that, but in many interesting cases, biology won't do that. And so you need to use previous biological knowledge as the context for looking at the data. Although it is worth noting, I mean, GWAS was successful despite not requiring any, yeah, requiring biology to bang people over the head. And in fact, you know, we're much more successful in the candidate gene area where we did weight in some way. But. Well, and, in, and in fact, biology didn't bang us over the head. I mean, it was, you know, 80% were in non-coding regions. Now, that's that's a biologic statement. But, but you know, the, the first two years, it was like, well, these must be wrong. You know? <laughs> so you, you have to consider the possibility that what we knew now, that what we know now is negligible compared to what, we're, and, and in that case, then you're very comfortable with throwing away, um, when, when microarrays came out, David Botstein said he was willing to throw away the textbook of biology and just base his new understanding of biology on what the microarrays told him. I was going to follow up the rest. I, you know, if, if we weren't Bayesians, then we wouldn't bother exome sequencing, right? The whole enterprise there is predicated upon a prior assumption about where function lies. So. So I would add to Bayesian camp that where we're talking that we don't know which variants are important for a particular disease, that's true, but that's the whole idea of Bayesian statistics. You put weight on based on what you know and then you learn from data. So, so I guess we could ask, are we gathering the data we need to learn from the data? And, and I guess what, what we've been hearing is that there is so much that goes unreported that could be interpreted or could be useful that, that we may not be capturing that. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, being the person who opened this particular can of worms. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, what I was, the point I was trying to make is that, first of all, that in GWAS actually, it really was not the case that being a Bayesian, I think, particularly helped. Um, and I don't know how much it's going to help here. And I think my main point was that it might, but I don't think that we yet have, I mean, we're getting a little bit of a sense of whether it might or not in some of the cases that um, Gonzalo and Mark alluded to would suggest that if you group all genes together, maybe Bayesian approaches might not even be that helpful. Um, and, but I agree, I think we probably need to get a better empirical sense to before we decide whether these sorts of approaches are going to be advantageous. And I would say, even though I brought this up, that in, in the absence of knowing whether that's, uh, whether they're advantageous, kind of the safest approach for not making false discoveries is to assume that you don't really know that much and, you know, and use a sort of uniform statistical approach. You know, again, Bayesian approaches can actually incorporate a range of priors and may, you may actually be able to have a principled universal approach that effectively incorporates some unknown weighting. Um, the place where I think it might actually be more um, helpful is when you're looking at an individual gene and well, I guess we'll get to that section later. I just was going to uh, amplify in Greg's comment that essentially when you're doing an exome experiment, you essentially have a prior. I mean, likewise, you know, when I think people are not taking into account structural variants and whatnot, there's essentially a prior there that they're not as, you know, relevant and so forth, and, you know. So just to, if I could just put add a point to that, which is that means that we have to be really careful about being sensitive to our implicit assumptions when we think we're being unbiased and just letting biology hit us over the head, but we haven't looked at 97% of the genome because it's not exome. So that, that would be a very good thing for us to capture in a, in a manuscript is that it's really important to be extremely rigorous about what your in, uh, implicit assumptions are in, in the study design from the very beginning. You know, and so, oh, sorry. 
Okay, so actually, just a, a balancing point. You know, th there's actually different layers of, of this question. You know, one is what what should be published, and I think we could be actually very liberal in saying that you know many of these things can be published, but there is a different layer of evidence on you know maybe what do you use to counsel a patient, and you know, and what establishes some you know truth of nature that you believe as a fact. You know, and uh, you know. It's, it's reasonable to say that, you know, in any one study, uh, you know, you could decide to use whatever weights you want and come up with a very interesting story and publish it and use the biology and whatever. But, but we should also be clear that, you know, very likely that single study probably doesn't get to the level of evidence of, you know, we have a truth of biology and maybe we should go and counsel patients on that basis, you know. So, I think you could imagine, you know, a range of levels of evidence for, for, for these questions. And I think for, for the ultimate level where we think, you know, this is a definite true finding, we, it's important to be quite strict or we, you know, we'll, you know, just have a, a jumble of things. Yeah, I, I, would, I, I would reflect uh, um, that, that idea and as well what sort of Mark was saying about um, being very clear about what hypotheses you ask and pre-stating those up front because there are going to be clearly cases where you can make a strong case given segregation, given how you understand the phenotype, and that's going to have evidence and you're going to be able to construct really clear tests of those questions. And that is a different, you know, those very um, really refined and specific, well-constructed questions um, are different than other kinds of well-constructed but more challenging questions which use less of the information that is available to you and require thus more evidence in order to um, control, if in a strict statistical sense, the degree of false positivity but um, allow you to make um, more general claims or, you know, expose yourself to more aspects of biology that you didn't know about. So, you know, I, when we sort of go in this sort of space where we're Bayesian and frequentist and are trying to reconcile these things, which I feel like are conversations that happened 150 years ago in completely different contexts, um, I think a lot of these things are really reconcilable and I think the key is just discipline about stating what those things are and trying to contextualize what that question means and what the evidence you're used, you know, what evidence goes into that. So every question you pose in a frequentist context, I bet you you can write down a prior hypothesis, can calculate power, calculate the Bayes factor that's appropriate evidence for the model. And it could be that one way of phrasing the question in a frequentist context or phrasing the same question in a Bayesian context is more or less convenient, but as long as we have really clear ideas about the way to translate that information, I think we will probably be okay if we can successfully do that, as long as we're disciplined in doing that. Uh, to follow up on Gonzalo's point, I, I, I agree we shouldn't um, actually aim for keeping um, findings out of the literature that are not um, uh, statistically completely convincing. Instead, what we should do is aim to have every genetic finding in a paper include the comment that the genetics alone either does prove pathogenicity of the variant or variants in a study or a gene or doesn't because what we, what we have right now is a situation where a whole bunch of different kinds of evidence are pulled together and you don't really know which evidence is supposed to be primarily carrying the story. Um, but if you actually require that the author would say, I am asserting that the genetics alone is proving the case and here is the reason. I think that would actually really help in the interpretation of the papers. And, and, and you can often do that with absolute clarity. I mean, as Shamil says, it's straightforward to, to ask if you're taking a gene-based approach whether you have evidence considering the number of genes. You have de novo mutations in X out of Y um, uh, patients in the same gene and you need to have Y as well as the X, which you, you, know, you don't always, um, then you can actually put a p-value to that without much difficulty. So, so I, I think that if we actually simply required that statement, the genetics does or does not prove the case by itself, before you get to interesting um, stories about the biology, that'd be really useful. Well, and, and, David, and Jeff, just a second, but David, it might, might be not only does the genetics prove it, but prove to us that it does prove it. So, so lots of people say, sure, you know, no problem. But, but you really want, you know, okay, what, what's your evidence that, yes, that it does I, prove it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that's <laughs> an extremely good point. And 
there can be a real benefit to the entire field to adopting that kind of an approach in, in how how you write your publication. And I think those those four autism de novo papers are a great example of that. In that there is now you can any of us can get access to all of the de novos that were found in those thousand samples. And the next person who sequenced 100 trios might be the first one to actually, if they get lucky and are the third hit in one of the genes or something, they're the ones who can, for the first time, have a p-value that they can be conf confidently say, we now believe this is the gene. And it's obviously only possible because the, you know, those earlier projects have generously put those data which are not yet genetically bulletproof in the public domain. And so I think that's definitely something to be encouraged because it's, I mean, you know, it will much more rapidly progress the ability to make those genetic proof statements. We have so. uh, I know I totally agree with, with this point about having, making sure we do get things in the literature and Joel's made a very similar point as well without hitting that high bar. Uh, but I guess a key point is that we also make sure that uh, as those literature results then into the databases, that that level of confidence is carried along with it. And that's not straightforward. Um, it's, not, it's, it's not easy to see how that would happen. But I guess uh, in the known variants session, we'll be talking to some extent about how you might design a, a database that actually carries some of that information along. Yeah, and, and I, I just wanted to chime in with agreement to, to David's point. I think we have a, a, you know, we've really backslid, if that's a appropriate past tense, in the, la in the last few years as we've gotten into sequencing because we, we had moved to a model where, all right, genetic findings are, are you know, we're going to lean on them, we're going to analyze them very clearly, we're going to prove that they're significant and replicated, and then we're going to move on to the functional studies. And now we've sort of slipped into a mode where, well, here's some genetic data, and then we look over here, and here's some functional data that says these are good variants, and then we'll move the curtain back over here, back to the genetic data a little bit. And um, it's very difficult in a lot of cases, as David points out, to actually follow the thread as to what's, you know, what's the tail and what's the nose or who's wagging the dog or whatever. Um, because you look at these papers and you don't actually know what's the most important, what's the compelling piece of data or evidence that is making me excited about, you know, this work or this relationship to disease or what have you. And, you know, how, whatever it is, it needs to be very, very clear. And as Daniel said, it becomes even more important as these things push into clinical databases for interpretation. Good. So, so it seems like we we have had a very good discussion of this, and I and I'm trying to. Uh, we we did get your last comment. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. okay. I haven't missed anybody. Yeah. Great. Um, we were trying. We did pick up some some extra time, and, and we're trying trying to spend that over over the day rather than use it all up in in one session. So what I might suggest is we we take our break now. It was a 20 minute break, and so so we come back at 10:30. But you but we're going to start at 10:30. So um, so we'll be sure that David that you're here, and and we'll we'll get going at at 10:30. Uh, thank you much.